<gülüyor> Merhaba arkadaşlar, hepiniz IFP Talks webinarlarına hoş geldiniz. Bugün Bournemouth University ile İngiltere'de finans programları ve kariyer fırsatlarını Endik, Henik, Mehdi, Filiz ve Talya'dan dinliyor olacağız. Lütfen sorularınızı questions kısmından sormayı unutmayın. Yes, Andy, the stage is yours now. Thank you very much, Zeynep, and uh, welcome everybody to this presentation uh, about Bournemouth University with a particular focus on our Department for Accounting, Finance and Economics. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen so you can uh, see our presentation, which hopefully you can now. There we go. Are we live? <laughs> Um, so joining us today, uh, my, well, my name is Andy, I'm from the international team of Bournemouth University. I'm one of our regional managers who uh, looks after uh, student recruitment um, in our overseas markets. Uh, joining me today, uh, uh, hopefully, will be um, uh, Dr. Davide Parilli, uh, Dr. Phyllis Alexander, who's with us, uh, Dr. Hani al and Dr. Medai Chowdhury. Um, and you can already tell from that list that uh, this is a very very international university i'm actually the only uh, believe i'm right in saying chaps i'm the only i'm the only brit who's actually uh, presenting uh, <laughs> presenting to you today uh, so that in itself says something about bournemouth university i think uh, a few other facts and figures i'm not going to go through everything here in great detail but bournemouth is a modern university we've been a university since 1992 um, and we've built a reputation, I think, for uh, being a very uh, dynamic uh, and uh, innovative university, doing things in lots of different ways. That has helped us establish a really good international reputation, which you can see reflected in our world rankings there, the Times Good University Guide and the world rankings from Times Higher Education. Um, so we have a, a good name uh, for the, uh, uh, the work that we do, the subjects that we teach. Uh, we're quite a large university, uh, as they go, about 17,500 students um, and around about 2,800 from overseas countries, including 90 from Turkey. So it's a, quite a large university, not the biggest in the UK by a long way, but, um, uh, but bigger than most. Uh, and it's a good size for us to be, I think. It works well for us. Um, and a very diverse student there with uh, over 135 countries countries represented in the Bournemouth University student body, which in itself uh, says again a lot about how international Bournemouth University is in its outlook. Bournemouth uh, as a town, as a place to live, is a beautiful place and you'll be hearing a bit more about that later on, I think, when we get to uh, uh, the Q&A. But you can see from these images um, at the bottom that Bournemouth typically <laughs> is a very sunny, uh, sunny, warm, uh, and uh, a beautiful seaside location. It is England, it is a bit grey, uh, sometimes it's a bit grey today, um, but uh, it's not unusual for, for you to find plenty of uh, sunshine here in Bournemouth. Um, it's a really nice location down on the south coast, quite a large population, about 185,000, um, so it's a very large town by British standards, not a big city, but a very large town. Um, very well known for its beaches, which you can see in the images down there, uh, as a, a, a tourist location as well. Um, uh, and a very cosmopolitan place. It's, it's actually a big centre for English language learning, one of the biggest uh, centres for language learning outside of London, actually. Um, but uh, increasingly it's known for its uh, international education. So not just the language learning, but uh, uh, Bournemouth University is one of three university institutions in the town. Uh, along with international colleges of various kinds and a large further education college. So it actually has a very large student population uh, alongside the local residents and alongside the tourists during the summer season. If you want to go and see the big city, uh, London's only a couple of hours away um, and you can get there by road or rail very easily. Um, and uh, so if you just want to go and check out the bright lights of, uh, of London while you're uh, while you're in town, then uh, you're very welcome to. But um, once you're in Bournemouth, you'll never want to leave, as I think uh, Tally will <laughs> Tally will make it clear later on. Tally is one of our student ambassadors, by the way, who's joining us today, and you'll be hearing more from her later on. Uh, accommodation, uh, we highlight here because it's a very important part of the student experience. Um, the, the place where you're living, your 
uh, your, uh, your private space is actually a very important part of your student experience. So we are going to highlight that uh, quickly here. And our accommodation is very high standards at Bournemouth University. Uh, most of it is in halls of residence, um, which are the large uh, buildings, such as you can see in the, the top and bottom images there. Um, uh, and in those, uh, in those buildings, you typically have a private study bedroom, usually with an ensuite bathroom, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, access to a kitchen which you would share with a few other students um, and very often those buildings will have gyms, laundrettes, games rooms, uh, plenty to entertain you as well. So the accommodation is pretty high standard. If your budget's a bit lower there are other options available but we have a lot of rooms in halls of residence so most of our students will end up in there uh, and if you're a postgraduate student you can access um, self-contained apartments within those buildings where everything is private. So private study bedroom, private bathroom, private kitchen, private living room, uh, if you prefer to uh, uh, focus on your studies and um, uh, keep your head down in your work, which is fine. You can see the costs there. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on that. Um, the session, I think, is being recorded, so uh, you can go back and, uh, and watch some of this later. Or find it on our website, www.bournemouth.ac.uk, which we'll put in the chat as well. Uh, now we're going to move on to the programmes in a moment, um, but we've just got an overview here of um, the programmes that we're going to be covering today, uh, which is MSc Finance, MSc International Accounting and Finance, MSc International Finance and Economics, and MSc Sustainable Economic Development and Emerging Markets, which is a very interesting uh, newer programme. Um, uh, you can see some of the facts and figures about them there and also some of our entry requirements. So if you have a bachelor's degree with at least a GPA of 2.3 from Turkey, uh, then you are going to be um, uh, eligible to enter that program. If you are from another country, by the way, if you're not from Turkey, but you're joining us today, uh, then by all means asking the questions about, um, uh, about what your own entry requirements would be, we'll be happy to pick that up. Uh, international students all have to give evidence of English language, as do British students actually, um, but uh, typically we're looking for an IELTS 6 overall uh, and an IELTS 6.5 overall for entry to the finance course, but lots of other alternatives out there if you're more familiar with Pearson, TOEFL or the Cambridge exams or Password or something like that. Um, we've got uh, plenty of options out there for you to take. Uh, fees are pretty competitive at about £14,500 for most of these courses um, and scholarships available up to the value of £3,500 uh, on the postgraduate programmes. Uh, that's guaranteed if you get a GPA of 2.8 from Turkey. Again, if you're from somewhere else, then by all means ask. Uh, we can also offer a, a more limited number of Turkey-specific scholarships at £5,000 if you have a GPA of 3 or above um, and so uh, that is something that um, is worth striving for most definitely. I'm going to hand over at this point to my colleague Mehdi uh, who's going to take you through uh, uh, the, the subjects themselves and, um, uh, and all the wonderful things they do in the business school. Over to you Mehdi. You're muted, Meadow. Can we <laughs> can we uh, get your microphone on, please, Meadow? Oh, hello, hello. Yeah, I, I forgot to unmute, but yeah. So, hello, everyone. And so, I can see there are like 50, 53 people actually in the chat now, and I can see some of you are actually putting your chats. But obviously, I cannot see you. But I hope that you are enjoying the talk that we are giving to you. Uh, so we are obviously from the Department of Accounting, Finance and Economics. I am Mehdi Choudhury. I am the Deputy Head of the Department of Accounting and Finance and Economics. And I also teach economics within the department. And with me also present here is uh, Dr. Phyllis Alexander, who is an, an expert in accounting and taxation, and also Dr. Hani Elbarden, who is an expert in accounting and finance trying to join is uh, professor david parilli he's probably having some some issues with, uh, with the connections but hopefully you will be able to join us later on uh, who is uh, david is an expert in uh, the uh, regional economic development uh, so that's uh, that's about us those people who are here and also i forget to mention about our student ambassador talia 
so nice to have her here. Uh, and as you can see, the list of the program that we have, we have four programs, full-time programs under the Department of Accounting, Finance and Economics, MSc Finance, MSc Accounting and Finance, MSc Finance and Economics, and MSc Sustainable Economic Development and Emerging Market. So just to mention you before we go to the programs a bit more is that MSc Finance, we call it a specialist master's because in order to study MSc Finance, it's expected that you have background in finance or in accounting or in economics. Also, it's expected that you have some background in mathematical and statistical analysis involved involving those programs. So that's kind of the, so that's why it is called a specialized MSc program. Other three, pro, three programs, we call them conversion masters. So you don't need to have such a background uh, like in accounting, finance or economics, but obviously it's expected that you have good undergraduate degree. So that's kind of the idea of MSc, specialist MSc and conversion MSc. Uh, and uh, that's it. So can, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, and so first program is our MSc Finance program that we are going to present here. So just you, the information that you can see, just some brief information about the program on the slide, but you can find more details of it uh, if you go to our web, web pages and the links will be at the end of the, of the presentation. So MSc Finance, as I mentioned, is a specialist uh, masters and it is it is delivered by a blend of theory and practice the course as you understand it offers uh, some some units that will help to develop quantitative skills and the ability to analyze financial data and understand financial instruments and so the aim is to prepare prepare for specialist jobs in financial institutions and just uh, for information name of the units financial markets Core units are like financial markets, money and banking, portfolio construction and theory, financial econometrics. And there are also options, risk management, derivatives, fintech, big data in finance. And after finishing the core and option units, students, they can go to placement uh, and this placement is optional. And otherwise students will go to the research project directly. But some people, some students will, will not go to the placement. They will go directly to the, to the research project. Uh, and some students, they will first do the placement and they will come and do the research project. So if you do the placement, then the program is, it, it's, it takes about two years. And if you do, do finish the research project directly, then it takes about one year. So just kind of like the idea, but the details of it, you'll find that in our web page. And I would recommend you to have a look at that. And just because obviously we, we are we are we are a university, so the biggest asset for us is the human capital. We are four people, four six people are actually present here from the university. So I thought that I should have some photos of them. And the photos you can see on top is prof of Professor Jan Scholscher, who is an expert in uh, financial analysis involving the East European countries and also and he is currently teaching uh, this year he was teaching the unit called money and banking you can see the name of it and also we have down at the bottom is the dr anna hillington she is she is uh, a, an expert in econometrics and she is involved currently in teaching risk management and also financial econometrics uh, that's kind of the our msc finance uh, and our next slide, I will hand over to uh, Dr. Phyllis Alexander and Dr. Hani Elbarden to take you through the program MSc International Accounting and Finance. Phyllis. Thank you, Mede, and, and welcome everyone. It's very nice to be here. So as Mede says, we, we do distinguish between a specialist um, postgraduate course and a what we refer to as a conversion course. And what we mean by a conversion is if you would like to actually uh, gain some knowledge and, and expertise in an area that you didn't study um, in your undergraduate degree, like accounting and finance, uh, then we do have programs that have been specifically designed for this purpose. And graduates from this program do, in fact, go on to work for accounting firms or financial institutions, but they also go to work for government organizations or 
multinationals or small and medium sized firms in perhaps accounting departments or finance departments. So it is, as you, you know, will have gleaned, a very versatile program indeed. Um, whether it is a subject that you want to gain an expertise in and a career in, whether that be accounting or finance, or if you just want to have a good understanding of these subjects that will then enhance your chosen professional career. Um, it, it is a fantastic um, you know, postgraduate program in that respect. So I've been teaching on this program for over 10 years now, and the unit that I teach currently is the International Tax Unit. Um, I'm not going to take any more of your precious time to just talk about one unit, but I have uploaded into the chat um, a project that I'm currently working on uh, that has an international tax case associated with it. So I'll let you have a look at that at your leisure. And I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Hanny Elberden. Thank you so much, Dr. Phyllis, and uh, nice to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Hanny Bardan. I'm senior lecturer in accounting and finance. I'm the program leader for accounting and finance for the undergraduates. And I'm here because I'm involved in teaching two units of this uh, international accounting and finance program. One of the core units, which is the financial reporting and analysis, and one of the option units, the CSR and corporate reporting. So just to give you a flavor of what are the uh, um, what we teach in the financial reporting and analysis, don't worry if you didn't study accounting before. We start with uh, um, assumption that you don't have any accounting knowledge. So you are going to learn how financial statements are prepared, what are the regulations that govern how these financial statements should be prepared. We are going to touch, touch about uh, corporate governance and then how to read the financial statements, how to use financial ratio analysis to uh, interpret the financial statements and to make links between the different numbers in different statements. And uh, we are not doing only numbers, but uh, a very important part of the uh, financial reporting is the narrative disclosure. So we are learning how to, to use uh, the narrative disclosure and make links between the narr narrative and numbers. And uh, this, this unit, to give you a touch of the assessments, there's no exams in this unit. So your understanding and learning will be assessed by two courseworks. One of them will be uh, individual coursework in, in, in a format of academic poster. You're going to learn how to present your understanding in an academic poster. The other type of assessment is a, a group project. So we are going to work with your colleagues to, to do financial statement analysis. We are doing real uh, uh, uh, financial statements analysis. So you'll be assigned to, to you'll be given two uh, sets of financial statements for real companies where you have to read and do uh, some financial analysis and investment decisions. The other unit is, is an option unit, the CSR and corporate reporting. It addresses a very important topic and very interesting unit. Uh, definitely you have heard about uh, climate change, global warming. So uh, in this unit, we are addressing how uh, companies should uh, uh, measure the uh, carbon footprint, the greenhouse gas emissions, how they can do accounting and reporting regarding their water usage, waste disposal, and how this affects the environment. So it's a very interesting topic, and, and if you are interested to be an environmental accountant, so this is the route and this is the unit for you. It's very important and very nice and very enjoyable uh, unit. This unit is assessed by coursework and exams, so we have a mix of different types of assessments, uh, group coursework and uh, examinations at the end of the um, unit. So this is just to give you a flavor of the details of the units taught in this kind of uh, um, program. The next slide will be talk about the last program and I will, I will hand over to Mahdi then to, to take you through the last one. Thank you so much and uh, I hope to see you all in Booms. Thank you, Hani and Phyllis, and for the very nice introduction. Specifically, Hani, you mentioned about the way we assess our programs, so it will be useful uh, to know about, about the assessment. Uh, so just to take you through this, uh, through this slide, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier that uh, Professor Davide Parilli, he's, uh, he tried to join us, but for some technical reasons, he could not join us. So 
I'm going to present this slide, but you can see his photo uh, at the at the top. Professor David apparently it's actually his brainchild, and it's kind of a very new program to think about at the MSc level sustainable economic development and emerging markets together. And we are really very proud of it. And it's designed in a way that it can be it is it will be managers, practitioners, public officers, academics. They'll find it interesting, like people who want to who already have done some economics or finance or have not done them, have some work experience and would want to top it up, would want to go back to the academia and want to learn about the current issues around uh, surrounding sustainable economic development and emerging market. This is the program. And obviously this this unit, this program prepares people for careers in city councils, uh, provincial council, research officers, in chair for charities and NGOs, and for international development or in organizations. And there are some core units and also optional units listed uh, there. And uh, also this program also has optional placement and research project. So I'm going to skip this detail of it because you can find all of them uh, if you go going through our, our web page. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And the last program, but obviously not the least, is the international economics, finance and economics. And this this program, again, I, I mentioned like the sustainable, uh, MSC Sustainable Economic Development Program. It, it is it is designed in a way that people who already have some work experience but want to learn more about finance and economics or those who have done finance and economics or have done accounting or have done some related subjects want to learn about this want to top up their knowledge want to enhance it want to get further experience on this talk, on this subject matter so this is this is ideal for them uh, so it will it will try to try to generate strong economic and finance skills and how to apply them into practice and obviously at the end uh, end it is it is designed for practitioners and this the by doing this program it is expected that students will learn about global markets issues surrounding them such as international trade finance and exchange rate so it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's obvious from the from the name of the program as you can see so just uh, just about the units that we have is, here is i i am involved in teaching of the of international economics of this program uh, you can understand what will be in the content by from the name of it and also you can see the photo of uh, dr darmot mccarty uh, who is involved in in the in teaching of economics of money and financial markets of this program uh, so that's uh, and you can see the core and option units listed and also as as other other programs we have uh, we have optional placement and research project for this program uh, so then yeah so i think can we go to the next slide please uh, so yeah, we obviously we are we are in total now five here, and but it's not five of us only. We are more people within the department uh, of accounting, finance, and economics. It's a quite really expanding team of people. We have uh, we have now about thirty plus thirty plus teaching and research staff. We all are involved in teaching and research, and also uh, the, and also. With academics, we have non-academic staff members who are who will be looking at administrative and support support that that are needed by students and also even for the staff members. And lastly, and very importantly, we have very strong student body. We have student student representatives, we have PhD student, and also the large body of students at the undergraduate and the postgraduate level. Just to obviously, Talia is here. I was just remembering. We actually, I had one master student i supervised uh, the student for for the master's research project he is he is currently doing phd at bournemouth university he is from from turkey so i'm not just i'm naming not naming him but he is from turkey if you want to know about the name of him please email me uh and you can see the big stem of acsb double acsb is the association advanced association for advanced collegiate school of business and it's, it connects the educators, uh, students, and businesses together. And it's, you can see this stamp, it's the stamp of excellence. Uh, and 
if you want to know more about double ACSB, I have actually have a link uh, on the chat uh, at the uh, uh, uh, uh, at top, so that will show, that will take you through more about uh, double ACSB. Okay. Uh, Uh, and yes, just uh, already uh, had he mentioned about our teaching and assessment, just this slide to complement it. So our teaching is that for per unit, we have two hours of lectures and two hours of seminars. And same in lectures are about introducing the topic, the framework, and the seminars are practicing applications and exercises the teaching in the in lectures and seminars are delivered using a blended method that's uh, what you can expect to take place from the future coming from september 2021 and the for and go, going on from there so it will be a blended method of face-to-face -face delivery and online online teaching we have a very strong online platform that calls uh, that calls bright space Brightspace also has Zoom plugged in in that for us so that we, we can deliver all our teaching via Zoom uh, if, we, if we want to. Uh, so that's, uh, that's so we are, we are very strongly positioned in online delivery and in blending, blended learning as a whole. And assessment, as you understand, is the assessments are, will, be, will be done through written work, ACS, oral presentation, and in some units exam, but we don't have a lot of exams. Uh, and uh, also, uh, sometimes you have individual assessments. Sometimes you will also have group assessments. Group assessments are used to uh, develop the uh, skill to work in teams. So that's we think that very important in in the modern world, in this globalized world. Okay, and yeah, and that's uh, this is the then that's the last uh, slide I'm going to talk about. It's kind of like self-explanatory. So in a modern big university, you'd want to you'd want to have a lot of other services available, and that's we have here a list of that you can see here. I'm just going to point to here is to the mathematical and statistical support center. So if you want to up your understanding of math and stat, and if you're a bit concerned, so you can obviously obtain support from there because our accounting, finance, and economics program that will involve a bit of quantitative analysis. And so just people who will be concerned about that, you may you may contact this service and get support from there. But that that type of that type of actually skill is now demanded by employers and more and more you need you need that type of skill in in doing those competition, look at looking at the financial data and make sense out of it. And that's what we try to deliver within our programs. I'm going to finish here and hand it back to back to Andy, but I hope that it, you found our talk useful. And our emails, you can find the link of our emails uh, uh, and uh, other information on the uh, on the presentation. So feel free to be in touch if you have any queries. And thank you very much for listening, Andy. Thank you, Mehdi. Yes, just to... Uh... <laughs> echo, echo, echo. Uh, just to round up, um, uh, we've got a few links here that um, uh, that you can revisit later on, which will uh, uh, take you to some useful sections of the website, uh, particularly about the Department of uh, Accounting, Finance and Economics, but also the Business School itself um, and our international student support uh, pages as well. Lots of useful information on the website, so drop in on bournemouth.ac.uk uh, for more information on any of that. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, for listening into the presentation. We've got plenty of time for questions now, and I'd like to uh, properly introduce, <laughs> or for the third time, actually, <laughs> uh, uh, Talia, who's one of our student ambassadors from Turkey. Uh, Talia is a, a stalwart of our student ambassadors. She's um, uh, she's an absolute star and has, uh, has joined us for virtually everything we've ever done, <laughs> I think, in and around Turkey or uh, in virtual events as well, uh, aimed at the rest of the world. Uh, also named on there is my colleague Nuria, uh, who I'm covering for today, actually. Nuria Mayane Martin is, uh, is uh, my fellow regional manager who has responsibility, actually, for uh, our student recruitment from Turkey. Uh, and so is, is normally the person you would be uh, in contact with. Um, uh, but uh, because of uh, uh, not being very well, she's uh, she's not able to join us today. But uh, you've got Noria's contact details on there, uh, and uh, Talia uh, we can talk to now. And um, 
uh, and you can also contact Talia later through UniBuddy, which is our um, online student chat platform. Uh, so by all means, uh, drop her a message on there after this event if uh, if you'd like to uh, if you'd like to have a chat with her. I'm going to stop sharing there. Okay, now Talia, uh, would you like to uh, say a few words about you and your experience before we uh, go into the chat itself? Um, yeah, so um, hi everyone, I've looked at the list, so uh, everyone here is uh, Turkish, so I'll just say merhaba um, arkadaşlar. So I'm uh, one of the student ambassadors for BU, but before that I, I've been here since 2018, so it's been three years now, I'm doing my second master's. So when I first came here, I came to study clinical psychology um, and I graduated uh, two years ago with distinction and then I got another scholarship. Now I'm studying my marketing again, soon to graduate with a distinction. Um, and my aim is to stay here. So um, um, in terms of what I was doing during my studies, uh, we didn't have um, an, we didn't have a placement. It wasn't optional, but I've had the chance to um, work as part of my studies. Uh, I was working, because I was studying psychology, I was working with uh, personality disorders with the NHS, National Health Service. I was the uh, research assistant of my lecturer, so I was helping her with that as well. And I was working as a student ambassador. So you have all the flexibility during your studies to do whatever you want to do, because um, you're an adult now, it's a master's degree. You have two or three days to attend to your lectures, but the rest of the week is for you to arrange some time for studies. You can also have part-time work uh, to cover your expenses, your rent and everything. Um, and after you finish, you will again have some time to focus on your career specifically, especially with the recent visa regulations that was announced two weeks ago. You can now stay in the UK for two more years if you were to extend your visa. Um, in terms of scholarships, um, because it's different for the finance course, I will just generally explain. It's, it was, it's 2.5 for the finance course to be able to um, apply for the course. Uh, but in terms of IELTS, in my case, I've graduated with an English, 100% English taught university. So I didn't need to provide IELTS. So if you have graduated uh, to, within the last two years from a 100% taught English university, you don't need to provide IELTS for BU. Um, in terms of scholarships, uh, if you're, um, if you would like to apply, I've just, I will put the link for um, international student scholarships uh, which you can apply. Um, but if you, if your um, GPA from your undergrad degree is over uh, 3.5, you can apply for the Dean Scholarship, which was the scholarship I received, which gives you 50% off your fees, which is a very competitive one. It's best to apply. Uh, as soon as you decide to study at BU. Um, in addition to all that, Bournemouth is a great town. I've been here again, like I said, for the last three years. Um, I love here compared to the other cities in the UK, which I've been like, to London, to Birmingham, to Brighton. Here's the best one I've been so far. Um, it's not very expensive. It's not very cheap. It's in the, in the middle range. So some, some of you are asking about the expenses. If you have around thousand pounds to spare per month, which is the government's kind of limit. If you have £10,000 to spare for your studies and expenses, you can apply for the, the visa. So that could be uh, why a recommendation to kind of spare £1,000 at least per month to do this. But you can, again, work as a student ambassador like I'm doing now, represent Turkey, uh, your country. Um, if you have any specific questions about finances, I won't be able to answer it, but if you have general questions about uni, I put the link for Unibody. If you go to Unibody and click on the country, click on Turkey, you can see me uh, and I'll be answering your questions. But if you have anything else in mind, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so that's me. Um, I hope that it was helpful. One, there was one question, Andy, from one student asking about dependence. So if they were to bring, come to BU, as a postgraduate student, how would they manage the dependence? Because I 
I haven't got a dependent, so I couldn't answer the question. <laughs> no, that's a very good question. Um, uh, certainly in the UK, you can bring family with you or other dependents, um, and they can have a dependents visa for the duration of um, uh, of your student visa. Um, if, uh, if you have children who are school age, then uh, they can go into the UK school system, or if they're preschool, then uh, there are uh, plenty of nurseries and childcare options around Bournemouth as well. Um, and we have a team who can uh, help you um, uh, find a suitable place to live as a family and make all the arrangements as well for um, uh, for having your family with you. It's not uncommon. We have quite a few students, um, especially postgraduates and researchers uh, who have their family with them. Uh, and it's perfectly possible to accommodate that. Absolutely. Um, I see we've got a few. Uh, you've been very busy, Talia, answering these questions. So that's brilliant. Um, uh, uh, I see there's a question about uh, the GPA requirement. Um, uh, yes, you can be accepted with lower than 2.5. Uh, the minimum for acceptance at the moment is a 2.3. Um, uh, that, uh, that is equivalent to a, a lower second class honours in the UK. Uh, and so that would be, uh, that would be uh, perfectly acceptable for entry to uh, any of the master's degrees uh, we've been talking about today. In fact, most of the master's degrees in the university. Uh, wouldn't get you the scholarship, that requires a 2.8 or above, but it would get you entry to the master's programme. Um, Talia mentioned uh, scholarships and I did I, I did touch on those briefly. Um, actually, the Dean's scholarship, I'm afraid, isn't being offered anymore. <laughs> so that's, uh, uh, that, one won't be, uh, that one won't be out there. But the Academic Excellence Scholarship is, um, is the highest value one, which is an automatic award of £3,500 fee discount. Uh, if you get a 2.8 or above. Uh, plus, as uh, I also mentioned for Turkey, um, there's a special £5,000 scholarship, which is not guaranteed, but um, uh, is one that uh, you can apply for um, uh, if you have um, uh, a higher GPA. Uh, but yes, uh, a 2.3 is, the, is the, the minimum to get into lower than a 2.5. Uh, yes, you can, just no lower than a 2.3. Um, uh, just, uh, Andy, Andy yeah. with, this, with this answer, I just want to add that uh, students uh, sometimes would come with a bit lower lower GPA, but then mm -hmm. we still consider them when we see that the, whether the degree is relevant or whether the students can demonstrate any kind of work experience. Uh, so that's also we take into consideration. If somebody without any like background knowledge of accounting or even finance who comes with uh, like five years, 10 years work experience that we do consider those things. Uh, so just to just to note about it. Mm, so it's GPA valid. is GPA. Obviously, we need uh, we look at GPA, but that's not the end of it. Just Absolutely. No, thank you, Mary. That's a that's very, uh, very useful point. Um, uh, Bridget was asking about the application deadline. Uh, Talia, I see you've answered that, but but uh, yes, it's it's a pretty flexible deadline. There is no hard and fast deadline for postgraduate entry. Um, if anyone here is looking to apply for undergraduate, there are deadlines uh, which apply um, uh, normally by the middle of January, but especially by the end of June. Uh, but for postgraduate, for any master's degrees, there's no strict deadline. But for September entry, we would recommend that you make your application um, uh, probably by around about mid-July. Uh, simply because there are other deadlines for uh, accommodation guarantees um, especially and uh, allowing plenty of time to arrange your visa and that sort of thing as well um, so to be uh, comfortably <laughs> ahead of uh, ahead of any deadlines in entry then um, uh, mid-july is sensible but as long as you can still make it <laughs> to the uk still get your visa in time we'll happily consider your application uh, right up until certainly the end of august um, I see you've been answering the questions about scholarships on there as well. Uh, da -da. Are there any other, uh, Talia, are there any questions you'd like me to pick up that you've uh, you've not been able to answer? Um, let me have a look. I think I've answered majority of them. I think you have. You've been very busy. <laughs> yeah, they, they've asked about the work permit. I said, like I said, they recently, literally two weeks ago, they confirmed it. They were talking about yeah. those extensions. Now I'm happy as well because I can apply. So I can take two more years. <laughs> yeah, but you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you need to kind of extend your visa. You need to pay for that national health insurance, like everything else. Uh, but you, you're eligible for that. Uh, some, some people are asking about the PhD programs. Mm. Uh, but like I answered, 
even if you work as a research assistant, you still need to pay the fees because I, my housemate is doing her PhD and she's still paying the fees. Um, what else? Yes, well, PhDs you... are, are certainly fee carrying, but th there are PhD yeah. uh, scholarships out there as well. And uh, there may be a PhD studentship, which would yeah. be a, a, a funded program. Um, uh, do you, uh, would any of the academic colleagues like to comment on PhD studentships? It's a studentship. Uh, actually, I was looking at another another uh, question. Uh, is I can see the name is uh, uh, uh, Talia has answered, but I uh, or to, uh, but I want to add a bit more. Is uh, the question by Zatie uh, Sevi uh, is how is the career opportunities in the in UK for international students after graduation from from masters in finance? So that's uh, just one to check. Uh, yeah, obviously, students uh, after finishing the degree the, within the current regulation can get two years visa and search for jobs. So, but within the Bournemouth University, we have dedicated services for for uh, for careers and placement for students. So, students can take opportunity and can get get advice from there, and and accordingly, that the university can help provide some help in searching for job when they are students of the university. Uh, and provide advice and necessary support as required. So we have some service, they are available for the for students of finance that uh, they can obtain job after doing their degree. Uh, about the PhD, which question was that? Uh, can can just... Uh, I just wondered if you could make some extra comments about PhD studentships, how many we offer, what the process would be, what kind of um, funding it entails. PhD program we have uh, we have a number of within the university we have some some scholarship is the VC scholarship that is available so, so in the, within that if students obviously I think the deadline is sometime in April uh, but which is which is quite near but students obviously can those who will be joining us for masters they, if they have good grade and if they achieve well they can think of doing PhD after say after finishing their masters in that case. So if they achieve good grade and they can then make an application uh, when the when the uh, when the visa scholarship is advertised and if and that will cover the tuition fee whole tuition fee uh, for for the for three years four years of the program uh, as required uh, and that's um, some students as I mentioned is that students would actually I had one master student I supervised him. And he finished his master's part. He had he has distinction. Then after three years, he's actually now doing PhD with us. And we have many, many students actually would do master's first and then would do PhD. So and then after actually doing PhD, some would work with us. And and like we have a number of colleagues who actually have done PhD in Bournemouth University and also in other places, like say some other university in the UK. So we are very good in producing PhD students and also providing employment to them. Uh, so yeah, and some uh, or some PhD students they will also sometimes work as a research assistant, so that can help support a bit uh, like living and accommodation. Uh, actually, I myself have appointed I, I think about three three PhD, uh, PhD students as research assistant for my research projects. Uh, so it's it's possible that students can get some extra funding while when they do their PhD. It's possibly also worth us pointing out that uh, we have a graduate loyalty uh, fee discount. So any student who graduates from one of our bachelor's degrees and proceeds into one of our master's degrees, or proceeds from a master's degree into uh, one of our PhDs, um, would automatically get a, a twenty percent fee discount. Um, which can actually be bundled with academic scholarships as well. So the, um, the, the tuition fee that's stated on the website is only ever a starting point. And uh, if we can get it down for you, then, uh, then we, we, we are talking about PhD and students, but we are also we should I should introduce here. I'm not sure is about uh, if it is Phyllis. Obviously, Phyllis, you you are you are a student here at Bournemouth. You did your undergraduate, if, if I am right. No. I did my master's, so master's yeah. I, I had, um, because my career before academia was in accounting. I worked for Price Waterhouse, this is before the merger, and I decided to do a, a master in taxation, and Bournemouth had that on offer. 
Um, and from the master's, I went into the PhD. And, and as uh, my colleagues, Andy and Mede, have intimated or, or said specifically, uh, yeah, you can get some uh, PhD research can be fully funded, okay? Uh, there is that possibility, or there might be a possibility of match funding. So there are opportunities um, for sure uh, to pursue. But, you know, one step at a time, uh, and the first step would be to do get an outstanding master's degree and, and then take it from there. Yeah, D Davida Perelli, he, he contributed in the chat uh, regarding the PhD scholarships. He said that about the match funding, if you are working in, in Turkey and your organization can support you, then bonus can support uh, with your fees. So it's match fund between the uh, foreign organization and BU. Thank you, David. And David is also actually uh, is the director of PhD program. So he, he, he is the best person. He's the guy to get to know. Yeah. <laughs> Chat with David while you can. Um, I see Safak has been uh, asking about integrated PhDs. I don't think we have any which are actually integrated with the masters, but obviously PhD um, is an in itself a kind of a flexible animal so if uh, if you've got a particular research topic uh, in mind that stems from your master's subject uh, then you can put forward a research proposal um, uh, and an application to uh, continue your studies at a uh, research level um, with a little bit of fine-tuning perhaps from your uh, potential supervisor um, the phd studentships which we've mentioned those tend to be fixed programs which have been designed by the university and you can apply to undertake that piece of research but there's there's then no flexibility in that so if you've got a particular topic in mind uh, you can apply to do that but uh, there will be fees applied but we can still potentially look at scholarships match funding and other ways of um uh, of making that affordable for you um I, don't th I think that's probably dealt with all the questions that I've been well, glaring yeah. at me. Has anyone spotted anything else? Yeah, one co one more comment from David. He said that we can upgrade uh, uh, MPhil into PhD and MR MERS into uh, PhD. David is the expert, so <laughs> that's, good, that's, that's good news. Uh, yes, the MPhil is um, uh, sort of a first stage PhD, I suppose, isn't it? First part of, and it can be upgraded with further work. Um, well, we've got some time. Do any of the uh, any of my academic colleagues want to add anything else to um, uh, to what they said in the presentation? Is there anything else that's burning on your mind you really want to uh, contribute? I think to? I could uh, just ch uh, chime in very briefly. I think uh, it's very important to. Um, uh, appreciate that this particular master's, whether it be in accounting or finance or economics, sustainability, these are uh, very professionally relevant courses, subjects, and we do work very closely with our industry partners and professional organizations to ensure that our curricula is constantly, you know, on the forefront. Uh, so there is that um, that impetus, you know, within the academic body uh, that are involved in the masters. So what you will be studying will be very professionally relevant. Um, and the assessments that we design are specifically, um, well, again, um, professionally relevant for, for the unit that I teach, the tax unit that I teach. My students are now tax advisors and they're going to be assessed as such at the end of the semester. They're going to be advising the client, which will be named. Anyway, I think that's all I wanted to, to chime in. Thank you very much, Andy. No, it's a really, I, a really valid I, point. I just want to add here is that, yeah, our students are really like, they are very successful so far in securing actually uh, their employment. and. Our like say from students from the from the economics and also finance backgrounds, they will go become also data analysts in in some organizations. Like I I had one student I I talk about him all the time now working in Harrods, so probably earning more than me, you know. So so it's uh it's possible, you know. It's the sky is the limit. Okay. So and we want to support you in that journey. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it's worth emphasizing that we're a very uh, professionally focused university. Uh, we have a, a, an unusually high level of industry engagement, I think, and professional engagement on our courses, uh, professional recognition 
of our courses. That was a big driver behind the AACSB accreditation, actually. Um, and AACSB, even if you haven't heard of it, is, is a really good thing to have on your uh, on your qualification. And a lot of um, students at the point they enter the university have not heard of AACSB, but it's something that your potential employers will know about, that potential progression universities elsewhere will know about uh, and will be looking for. It's a really good quality stamp. Only 5% of business, uh, business schools worldwide uh, achieve AACSB uh, and it's actually a very big achievement for a, a, a young modern university like Bournemouth University to have achieved so it's it's a really good uh, quality stamp to have and it's not just on the business school it's on the degrees themselves it's on the qualifications and so you take that with you uh, as a graduate um, and so it, uh, it carries on helping you as much as it helps us um, and it's it stems from the, the way in which we teach, the way in which we develop our courses uh, and the, the extent to which we engage with the professions uh, and seek their uh, recognition uh, of what we're doing uh, at the university. Um, and it goes beyond that as well. Obviously, all, most of our academic staff are involved in research and in consultancy uh, in and around uh, the industries that they're, uh, they're, they're working in. And so um, uh, that feeds a lot of different uh, links and recognitions through uh, back to our courses. Um, so AACSB is a is a, a, a symptom of that. <laughs> it's, the word, it's probably not the right word to use, but it's um, uh, it's a it's a, a factor in that. But um, uh, it's uh, it indicates that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than you necessarily see in a program description or on the website. Now. How are we doing? We've still got a few minutes. Is there anything, Talia, that you'd like to add or anything that you'd like to pick out um, to expand on? Um, I think definitely we've covered everything. Like normally I would cover more on the scholarships and the kind of work permit, but I think we've covered them all in detail. Um, if you have specific questions about the city on its own, accommodation, expenses, location, just go to YouTube and type Bournemouth Uni Tidia and you'll see all my blogs and videos. <laughs> I've been doing them <laughs> over the last two years. So you can just literally all the things that you would need or even you wouldn't need will be there. So you can just access them. And you can also read our blogs and blogs. So I will put the link for that one as well, just in case someone wants to read. Thanks, Talia. And it, it really does. Question uh, oh. regarding the pandemic situation in the UK. So, also, could you please answer that question? Ah, yes, yes, that was just coming from uh, Saturday. Uh, so how is the pandemic situation in the UK? Education is online hybrid during this period. Yes, it's uh, during this period, it is. Um, uh, uh, academic colleagues can perhaps fill out um, in a moment how. Um, uh, how we're delivering that specifically in terms of platforms and times and that sort of thing but um, but basically yes while, while we've been in uh, in the pandemic period we have been teaching uh, online we do anticipate moving back to uh, campus teaching to a large extent from September probably with some online just to reduce numbers on campus um, but uh, these are normally campus-based programs so uh, under normal circumstances which hopefully will be back to something like normal <laughs> before very long. Um, uh, under normal circumstances, you would be uh, campus-based the whole time for these programs. But yeah, I'll, I'll hand over to the, um, the academic colleagues to, uh, to just fill out a little more on, on how we've been delivering online during that time. Yeah, it, it, it was a big move for everyone, not only academicians, but on, uh, also students, big, big move to the online platform. But surprisingly that we all coped up with the new uh, norms and we learned a lot about different platforms like the one that we are using now and we have brilliant uh, VLE which is the bright space which gives us lots of uh, uh, um, virtual places to contact with students like virtual uh, classrooms like discussion boards we are using different techniques like Mentimeter, Padlet lots of ways to interact Microsoft Teams, so different ways to interact and, and, and even doing better than the face-to-face -face environment like student small meetings, I'm, I'm meeting with my students during any time of the day using this Microsoft Teams. We have some <coughs> uh, uh, uh, like um, storage to store some documents for each small group so it was very interesting this move and we have different levels like gold level and silver level of 
of updating our way of delivery and most of our colleagues reach to the gold level where we all learn the new techniques but hopefully uh, as andy said that by september we are going back to face to face but we'll keep recording our sessions because it seems that many students would like to see or watch the videos in their own times so we're going to go back to face to face but we'll keep some on online uh, delivery as well that's a great answer. Thank you, Hani. It, it's probably also worth pointing out that, that Bournemouth University already had an enormous amount of digital resource um, prior to the pandemic. It was um, we, we actually have the largest digital library collection of any university in the country, uh, which put us in a pretty good position for being able to handle online teaching because we didn't have to uh, compromise the research material students could access very much. A lot of our courses actually have 100% downloadable reading lists. Um, and uh, and so every every textbook, every uh, every piece of research material you need to access is was already available digitally for those courses, and uh, uh, has been enhanced. I think in that time for a lot of others as well. Um, so we were we were well placed as a university, I suppose, to move to online. It's always a, a steep learning curve, but uh, but I think Bournemouth managed it pretty well. I have to say, uh, the postgraduates this year um, have been absolutely wonderful, and they have quite, quite um, on their uh, on their own initiative developed these small working groups, and and have commented on how much they've enjoyed getting to know people from around the world because they have been tuning in from around the world remotely. Um, so the postgraduates. Um, have really quite surprised me that the undergraduates didn't um, re, um, adapt quite so well. Uh, but I think the maturity or whatever um, that we saw in the postgraduates um, has been quite remarkable this year. But again, as Andy has said, as, as um, Hani has said, we, should, we do expect to be on campus uh, for you know, a good part of our delivery from September. Which we're looking forward to because it's a really nice campus. Yeah, I definitely. Yeah, I'm. I'm with uh, what Hani, Andy, and also Phyllis mentioned. We expect to go back to the campus because we want to obviously have the face-to-face -face interaction. But as but I I don't think that we will be we will completely get rid of hybrid the blended delivery because we can see a lot of advantage of it. So like we are have having this delivery with you five people of us here, one David in chat. So six uh, six people actually in total in turkey virtually so it's really it's amazing that we can do it like this and so we obviously we don't want to we still want to keep doing it but on top of that we have the face-to-face -face delivery so that's our expectation about delivery and bournemouth university has actually a very strong platform uh, called bright space that helped us to actually in this transition uh, during the pandemic a lot uh, yeah Okay, well, we're just about out of time. We've got a couple of minutes left if anyone wants to throw in a last minute question. But uh, uh, but otherwise, I think it's going to be a question of me saying thank you to all of you, to Mehdi, to Hani, to Phyllis, to uh, Divide virtually <laughs> in the chat, and to Talia. And our thanks to IEFT for hosting us today. And uh, thank you all for attending and listening. Zainab, I'll hand back to you. Yes, thank you very much, Andy. I think uh, it was a great presentation and it was really informative for the web uh, attendees. So uh, I would like to thank all of you and the participants as well. Uh, in Turkish, katıldığınız için teşekkür ederiz arkadaşlar. Bournemouth University ve ilgili diğer sorularım için paylaşmış olduğum mail adresinden Nuriye ile iletişim geçebilirsiniz. Aynı zamanda paylaşılan linkleri de incelemeniz faydalı olacaktır. Alt webinarımızda görüşmek üzere. Thank you again, you guys. It was a pleasure to have you in IFT Talk. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank bye. you for having me. Bye bye now. Bye bye.